So today we are going to discuss a classical model that captures light atom interaction. This is the simplest model for the active medium that we are going to consider. Now remember that this is a classical model. It doesn't capture all the aspects of, uh, uh, of the quantumness of the material. Yet it has got some, it gives us some immense insights. And these insights uh, are also carried on to the completely quantum model, okay, or a semi-classical model, where light is uh, classical but atom is quantum, and even to the completely quantum form, you see that the 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 insights that we gain in the classical model continue to remain valid. You know that uh, light interacts with with atom is through the classical a force we call this the Lorentz force where for example if E is the charge then if I apply electric field E or, or uh, also have a magnetic field B then this is the way the uh, the charge is go this is the way the force is exerted on the charge where V is the velocity of the charge uh, E is the uh, the amount of charge itself let my e let it be a negative number this would this is for the electron right so we are looking at the electron and uh, for the atom right let me assume a few things my atom has got a nucleus and uh, the electron so in the simplest scenario let us say the mass of my nucleus is denoted by mn the charge of the nucleus is minus e remember because e was a negative number so this is a positive number and uh, the mass of the electron is me and the charge on the electron is e right this is so this is for the nucleus now if i am writing down the newton's equation that govern the motion of such a uh, the electron nucleus bound system so I can write down the, the equations of motion for each of these. So let me write down, for example, the, the mass times acceleration. So the mass of the nucleus times its position, which is Rn by dt square. I'm looking at acceleration now of the nucleus. This is given by uh, minus E times the electric field at the location of the nucleus at a time t plus a binding force which keeps the nucleus and the electron together. This is the force on the nucleus due to the electron. Similarly, I can write down the, the Newton's law for the electron which is mass of the electron, the acceleration of the electron, this quantity is equal to E times the electric field now at the location of the electron at time t plus the force which is keeping the electron, binding force that is keeping the electron with the nucleus. Right? So remember that this is the binding force which keeps the atom together. So this force is essentially arising out of the Coulomb force which is keeping the nucleus and the electron together. All right. Uh, we will get back to this binding force uh, soon but now let's look at the following. So what I do is I make a transformation. I go from uh, this kind of a uh, uh, system coordinates that describe uh, the location that is from Re which is the location of the electron Rn which is the location of the nucleus from these coordinates I make a transformation towards x which is the relative coordinate and the center of mass coordinate right so the relative coordinate uh, you know is simply I define it that Re minus Rn gives me the relative coordinate x and it is this coordinate that we are interested in 
we are not interested in the the center of mass motion of the atom itself and for the discussion on the center of mass right you can quickly look at uh, meloni and eberly and they describe it beautifully but our interest here is in laser action but for example we were looking at laser cooling where we are looking at the motion of the atom itself then we would be you know looking at the 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 center of mass motion of the atom now that i have gone from explicit locations to their relative locations right uh, uh, their relative coordinate uh, i also need to go from the explicit masses to the reduced mass so m is my uh, reduced mass so a small clarification we have not considered the magnetic field coupling uh, to the electron electronic motion simply because uh, the velocity is involved that is the velocity of the charge within the atom is much smaller than the speed of light so i wanted to carefully note this inequality that is you have the the velocity much smaller than the speed of light and uh, hence v times b which is the magnitude of that the force is much much smaller than e itself uh, you know that this is true because the electric and magnetic fields themselves are related in um, electromagnetic waves where the magnitudes are related by uh, the velocity of light that is you have b the magnitude of b is simply e by c so it is because of uh, this large difference between the two forces we confine our uh, we confine our discussion with the forces arising due to the electric field only right so we just put all this together and go into uh, you know the the new coordinates right we have gone in from the new coordinates being the the relative uh, position which is the difference between the locations of the electron and the nucleus and uh, that is x and capital r is the center of mass coordinate of this of the atom uh, as you can clearly see we are interested in the internal degrees of freedom of the atom so we are not interested in the overall location of the atom uh, hence we are not going to look at the equation that governs the center of mass of this atom uh, you can clearly see that in applications such as in uh, cooling where you want to cool the atom there you are interested in the overall motion of the atom and where for example the center of mass motion will become a important aspect so anyway let us focus on the internal dynamics so i can write down the uh, the governing equation which i uh, which essentially is uh, what governs the coupling between the uh, between the atom and the uh, and the electric electromagnetic field so here m is the reduced mass right and d2x over dt square gives me the corresponding acceleration right uh, small e times capital e is the uh, force exerted by the electromagnetic uh, wave where capital e is the corresponding electric field associated with the electromagnetic wave and you have the uh, coupling of the nucleus and the uh, electron and this uh, this coupling or the binding force as we call it is essentially what keeps the electron bound to the nucleus now uh, let us understand the scales of this problem uh, so if you look at uh, you know the relationship between re and rn right so the location of the electron is the location of the nucleus plus x and x essentially corresponds to the atomic dimensions and we know that uh, even for large atoms hydrogen it is less than uh, angstrom but even for large atoms we are going to be limited to uh, roughly tens of angstroms maximum and if you look at the electromagnetic wave itself the wavelength corresponds to about thousands of angstroms so you see the electric field which i have written down here which couples to the atom one really doesn't distinguish between whether the electric field is at the location of the nucleus or at the location of the electron what we are saying is that the electric field is more or less constant 
across the whole atom and hence we have looked at the electric field at the location of the uh, or the center of mass of the atom without you know getting into the microscopic detail of where the electron might be dynamically as the system evolves All right uh, simply because of this spatial scales which are very distinct uh, and uh, large by the way this is what is uh, relates to something called the dipole approximation uh, which is what uh, we will we will come to uh, in greater detail as we go along but then uh, you know uh, that is the way to look at the problem now you see one can look at this uh, the force applied on the electron as arising out of a potential now this is a standard technique that one does for uh, uh, for conservative forces but indeed in this case uh, there is a time dependent uh, potential that one is talking about because the force itself is time harmonic arising from the time dependence of the electromagnetic wave so anyway one can write down the potential that governs that force in this manner uh, wherein you are looking at essentially the uh, dipole moment associated with the atom right remember the minus e times x will give me the dipole moment uh, associated with the atom dotted with the electric field so you can see that uh, the gradient of the potential when you take the gradient with respect to the uh, with respect to the coordinate x the relative coordinate so minus gradient of the potential will actually give you the force that we have been looking at right so that is important to note that indeed one can write this as arising out of a potential now the potential in general is a function of uh, the relative position as well as center of mass position and time uh, this definition of the potential is self consistent with the uh, the appropriate electromagnetic force that has been exerted on the atom so uh, just to note on the dipole moment you know e times x is the dipole moment if you recall the definition of the dipole moment it is simply summed over all possible charges their charge and the location and uh, so hence it is given as e times re minus rn which precisely is the dipole moment associated with the atom now let's look at this uh, last term which is the uh, next term in our uh, governing equation which is the binding force now this is where the lorentz model actually comes in so uh, remember that lorentz model is not a model for the atom it's a model for interaction between light and atom so if you look at the lorentz model you will see that what one is saying is that the electron is actually bound to the nucleus we know through uh, a coulomb force but then what one is saying is that there is no because it's bound system there is a equilibrium position if you like where there is no force and as you apply a external field the electron uh, sort of makes forays about that equilibrium position as though a spring is attached to the nucleus right so we are perturbing the electron from its equilibrium uh, position which is let's say x equal to 0 and the electromagnetic field or the electric field force okay lorentz force arising out of the electric field coupling uh, electric field of the electromagnetic wave coupling to the atom it basically moves the electron away and the force pulls it back so it's kind of a coupling arising to that uh, mimicking a spring so that is precisely what is captured in the lorentz model so in the green i have written down so there is my ks here is actually the spring constant of such a coupled uh, system right coupled uh, electron to the nucleus and indeed the spring constant depends on the uh, coulomb force for larger atoms for example you know uh, one also has screening and so on so uh, you might find that the the spring is weaker uh, somewhere the spring is stronger and so on so one can associate some sort of classical equivalent spring mass system for this coupling of the electron to the nucleus indeed there is a location x equal to 0 and as you go away the uh, the nucleus basically pulls back the electron to its equilibrium position uh, so the other important element which i want to include is the damping force uh, which one associates with oscillators so you see uh, why are we including it because in realistically whenever you have 
the classical model of a charge right uh, bound for example or a charge which is accelerating clearly there is there are forces on the charge clearly the charge is going to accelerate and uh, accelerating charge actually uh, emits uh, radiation and uh, one can think of even in the quantum model one can think of this radiation as that of spontaneous emission that is you create this dipole moment in the atom but the dipole moment decays uh, because the atom gives away uh, the energy or radiation through spontaneous emission and the dipole moment decays so that is precisely what is captured in such a frictional force so the simplest form of the friction force is that which is proportional to the velocity so i am just calling uh, p to be a constant and the frictional force is proportional to the velocity of the atom and uh, we, if you put all these forces together right one can come up with the final equation that essentially governs the lorentz model of the light atom interaction so the so the equation is this so you have on the left hand side the acceleration then you have the frictional force which is minus b times dx over dt then you have the spring force or the binding force uh, arising from the uh, electron nucleus coupling or bump or binding and you have the external force which is coming from the electromagnetic field that is impinging on the atom so uh, now there is a uh, i rewrite in their explicit uh, for example i am putting in the clearly the harmonic dependence of the electric field and so on so i am rewriting it where i have divided the whole equation by the reduced mass m and i put it back in here and i can identify clearly that my factor beta which governs the damping is simply p by 2m this factor of 2 is got because of the uh, lorentzian that we will see later but then i am putting in this pre factor 2 beta and then uh, ks by m would give me like you know like in you know, a harmonic uh, uh, frequency associated with the spring you will quickly realize that this is what the frequency uh, of oscillation of that of that uh, ideal spring mass system would be so omega naught square is simply the uh, square root of the spring constant by the mass and on the right hand side i am writing down the the drive for such a system the drive is arising precisely because of the electromagnetic wave that is impinging on it so epsilon is the polarization associated with the electric field so imagine that the polarization is along a particular direction let's let's call it x then we will generate the displacement uh, of the uh, of the electron in that direction so epsilon direction and the x direction will actually match so this x denotes that induced dipole moment which is along the direction of the input polarization of the electromagnetic field right so we have epsilon times e by m e naught e naught is the amplitude of the electromagnetic wave and cosine omega t minus kz gives me the harmonic space time dependence of the electromagnetic plane wave that we are looking at right now you see to look at the solutions of this equation number one uh, one has to do uh, two things one is to first look at the homogeneous part of the equation that is set the right hand side of this equation to zero find out a solution and then also find out the particular solution arising from the inhomogeneous part and uh, you will see that because of this damping term which i have introduced the homogeneous solution actually dies out in in some time i would urge you to uh, you know identify this equation this equation actually governs a, a, a oscillator which is uh, damped as well as uh, driven right so this is the drive this is the damping and you have the oscillator whose uh, ideal oscillator frequency was omega naught so in this driven damped oscillator system in steady state what would remain is the particular solution or the, the solution associated with the inhomogeneous uh, equation so you have 
essentially the system will oscillate at the same frequency omega as that of the drive right so driven oscillator so what i do to figure out the inhomogeneous part of the solution what i consider is this ansatz which i have written down here right so this ansatz is basically telling me that x of t is some vector a which i want to uh, determine and uh, the time dependences of this kind exponential minus i omega t minus kz which is precisely you know the uh, the harmonic dependence of the electromagnetic wave right? that's a drive so hence the solution also will be at the same frequency uh, and so on so i i plug in this x of t form into my equation number one and i get this algebraic relationship right you can check this for yourself and we can get the form for a to be the following so a is a vector which is along the direction of epsilon as expected uh, e by m by e naught is gives me the amplitude of that you know sort of coupling and then you have a denominator which is omega naught square minus omega square minus 2i beta omega now it's important to realize what this is you can clearly identify for yourself the fact that uh, at omega equal to omega naught the denominator of a is going to be the smallest and hence the amplitude of this oscillation which we are getting as a solution is going to be largest at omega equal to omega naught that is what is the uh, the condition for resonance so you have a driven oscillator it has got a natural frequency which is omega naught if my drive frequency is matching with the natural frequency i get resonant phenomena right that you know the other important thing i have done is to uh, rather than the the equation number one was completely real i have solved a complex equation by going to the complex notation that is simply makes my life easier you can clearly see i easily got the algebraic relationship and the form for a uh, quite simply and what i will do is because i know that my original equation was uh, real i will look at only the real part of the solution which i get after it's a linear equation so i can easily uh, do that without any uh, problem so my x of t the real x of t is simply the real part of this uh, this form uh, that i had answers that i had assumed and the explicit form for a basically governs the amplitude of the response associated with this uh, driven uh, damped oscillator right so this is going to be the solution in steady state uh, this is a very uh, you know interesting form which has got multiple aspects so one can for example look at various aspects of phase relationship between the original drive and the response clearly there are complex numbers involved so the phase is going to be uh, a very interesting object and you will see that it actually depends on whether the frequency of the drive is below the natural frequency or above the natural frequency and so on or even at resonance so the phase relationship between the drive which is electromagnetic wave and the driven system which is the generated dipole moment is going to have a very interesting relationship which i urge you to explore right so now because we have got x of t how do you go about and use that to determine you know uh, the optical quantities which is which are largely uh, dominated by the polarization of the medium so a quick recap remember that my dipole moment at the microscopic level is given by this small p which is e times x by definition the polarization which is the macroscopic quantity is simply number density times the dipole moment because uh, uh, you know that the polarization is defined as dipole moment per unit volume right so capital n is basically telling me i have uh, n independent capital n independent dipoles which are not talking to each other that's independent uh, in a particular volume right so that gives me the number density of dipoles and that is what my definition is so i can rewrite my capital polarization which is what is significant for us back into this equation where capital n uh, factor uh, comes in so what i have done here is now collected the real parts of my uh, response which basically what determines the macroscopic polarizations that go into the maxwell's equation 
the polarization is in the direction of the electromagnetic field polarization right these are two different polarizations so epsilon times n e square by m and i have simply what i have done is to multiply by the complex conjugate you know sort of of the denominator and separated the real and imaginary parts and this is the real part so you see that the real parts of both the terms come in that is is a product of omega naught square minus omega square which is the real part of the denominator times the cosine omega t part coming from the exponential on the numerator plus you have you know the uh, the the both the imaginary parts multiplying to give you this 2 beta omega e naught sine omega t minus k z now you can clearly see that not only there is a term which is in phase with the electromagnetic field which is the cosine the first term on the left which is the cosine omega t minus kz there is also a out of phase term which depends on e naught sine omega t minus kz so here is where i was talking about that phase lag it's essential that the phase lag is present for us to be able to couple energy into this oscillator uh, and clearly the phase lag depends on very much this uh, this parameter beta remember beta governs the damping so this parameter beta is uh, crucial for us to have this coupling and hence the phase lag between the uh, the drive and the driven system right now uh, there is uh, again of course please also note the denominator uh, which has that uh, resonant feature that omega being equal to, equal to omega naught will give me the maximum polarization that is generated that's a on resonant polarization right there's another way to uh, look at this uh, and this is just by definition uh, it uh, it will help us to understand this notion of polarizability uh, so i'm introducing this parameter called alpha of omega right which I am calling it as polarizability. It is a measure of the ability of the external field to polarize my uh, my individual dipoles, right? So it's essentially uh, uh, the polarizability itself, uh, in principle, can be thought of as a tensor uh, because you see uh, the, the the dipole moments uh, themselves can be an isotropic and so on. But we will look at the simplest scenario where the dipole is generated along the direction of the incoming. Uh, uh, radiation uh, direction the polarization of the incoming radiation so you have the dipole moment uh, the ratio of the complex dipole moment divided by the complex electromagnetic field is basically this uh, complex alpha which is called the polarizing right so you can uh, see that i can uh, essentially this captures that part of the coupling between the the field and the atom without uh, you know uh, keeping uh, track of the input uh, electric field so see this part uh, is uh, simply the the pre factor that we had got and that is what polarizability uh, captures clearly the polarizability is largest when i am at resonance the polarizability decreases if i introduce damping in my system right so larger the damping lower is the polarizability of the corresponding uh, atomic system and so on so uh, that's an important parameter that captures this coupling between the atom and the field. And again, I can rewrite my macroscopic polarization that goes into my Maxwell's equations as simply number density of dipoles times the dipole moment itself. So uh, rather than repeatedly writing this fraction, I have captured all of it in my alpha of omega or the polarizability.
So now let us get back to the Maxwell's equations and uh, write down the wave equation and figure out how the polarization acts like a source term. So uh, you will quickly recall what we have done. So we looked at the curl of a curl, uh, right? And so we, we derived the, the wave equation where you had the following form. Uh, you can just go back to the lectures on Maxwell's equations uh, and you will find it there. So what you got was del cross del cross E equals minus and we know that that D is simply epsilon naught E plus P where epsilon naught is the vacuum electric permittivity. So we put back this and utilize our source free uh, condition that is on the left hand side you would get gradient of a divergence of E minus del square E. This on the right hand side is simply minus mu times dou square e over dou t square times epsilon naught minus mu times dou square p over dou t square. So uh, we use the transversality condition from the Gauss's first law that is it's without any free charges this goes to zero and then what I get is basically the wave equation in the following form which is dou square E minus uh, remember that we are looking at optical regime so the non-magnetic media mu is equal to uh, mu naught right uh, or in other words my mu relative is 1 so I can as well write this as minus 1 over c square the mu becomes mu naught it is dou square e over dou t square and on the right hand side I have got mu naught dou square p over dou t square so this is my wave equation wherein the left hand side essentially corresponds to uh, free space propagation and the material characteristics actually comes in as a source term on the right hand side right this is where the polarization could be linear nonlinear and so on and so forth uh, we will uh, put in the polarization um, here on the right hand side and so uh, and we have assumed that we are looking at uh, plane wave solutions right so uh, what it means is that when I take the derivatives in space or time the appropriate the dependences are only those clean exponents uh, they basically uh, act only on the exponent and we get very simple expressions so for example uh, when the del square operates uh, you remember that we are looking at a wave which is propagating along z plane wave uh, going along the z axis right so uh, if you look at that so you have only the del square operator dou, dou square over dou z square operating on your um, uh, on the wave so what you get is basically a minus k square because it brings out i k uh, uh, plus i k every time and then uh, you have minus and you get uh, minus omega squares omega square which is coming out so that becomes plus omega square over c square this is on the left hand side and now I'm writing down this is the electric field itself which is e naught right exponential minus i omega t minus k z remember that k is my propagation constant and on the right hand side again I have a similar situation remember that I can write down my mu naught 
is equivalently 1 over c square epsilon naught right so let me use that and what I get on the right hand side is minus omega square c square I think I have made a sign error here so on the right hand side I should get a plus sign right so that gives me so that results in a minus here uh, apologies for the error and uh, so what we get is basically the so if you look at my p now the only time dependence is there in the exponential i omega t so that minus omega square has already come down and the rest of it needs to be written which is n times alpha which is the polarizability as a function of omega right by epsilon naught remember this is uh, what is pending from there this thing multiplied by the field itself which is e naught exponential minus i omega t minus k z right so this is our equation wave equation now in presence of the source this implies in the plane wave basis I need to ensure that the coefficients of these are actually equal so what it comes down to is that what we get is something called a dispersion relationship that is my k square should be equal to omega square c square I can take it as a common outside right and this becomes 1 plus n times alpha by epsilon naught which which by the way we rewrite as omega square over c square times n square of omega right so this quantity is what I am calling as related to the refractive index and you can clearly see this is a complex refractive index it's got a real part and an imaginary part that is I am rewriting my right hand side to be omega square over c square times n real of omega plus i times n imaginary of omega whole square right that is the refractive index which I which I am talking about um, by the way uh, this is a very important constraint uh, which was which is what we call as the dispersion relation why it is important is because what it is doing is it is uh, comparing the periodicities in space to that of periodicities in time for, for this wave which is in a medium right so uh, the k square corresponds to that periodicity in space and omega square is in time but then it is not directly related as in free space there is this factor of refractive index that seems to uh, to uh, to govern it all so let's look at uh, you know what does what is the explicit form for the refractive index that is arising from my Lorentz model right so uh, clearly I can write that out so that is my n square of omega can be written as 1 plus I'm simply writing out I'm opening up the alpha of omega so which is going to be e square over m epsilon naught omega divided by omega naught square minus omega square minus 2i beta omega right now clearly this is what I want to write down now to identify the real and imaginary parts of this refractive index so I want to write down this right hand side as the n real which is a function of omega plus i times n imaginary whole
So let us look at the consequence of invoking a imaginary, a real and imaginary part to the refractive index. So you know that our electric field can be written down. This is just to you know show you what exactly is happening. My electric field is given as E naught exponential minus i omega t minus k z. Uh, I can rewrite this uh, inside the medium. This is going to be E naught exponential. So I take the omega out from the exponent and what I get is t minus. Now remember that my k itself uh, has become omega by c times n, right? n of omega. So I am using, this is my dispersion relationship. So I am using it as it is, that is it's n of omega by c times z. So I am taking my n of omega and writing it as n real plus i times n imaginary. So if I put it back in here, what I get is minus omega z by z times exponential minus i omega t minus n real So we clearly see here that now we, what we get is a plane wave indeed with the usual harmonic dependence, but you have this amplitude of the wave, right, which is exponentially decaying. Not just that, this amplitude, the, the decay depends on the imaginary part of the refractive index, right? That is, if I, for example, compute from here, my intensity as a function of z if you like, right, which will be proportional to the mod square of this, right, which by the way will turn out to be simply i naught times exponential minus 2, the imaginary part of the refractive index times omega times z by c and this is indeed what is referred to as an absorption coefficient. It's exponential minus absorption coefficient, which is a times z. You have seen the uh, Beer's law for absorption, and that is precisely what this is, where you have shown we have shown that the absorption coefficient is basically twice the imaginary part of the refractive index, which is a fun omega dependent function times omega by c, which by the way, in other words, when you look at the real imaginary parts separately, will simply come out to be this quantity. Uh, we will compute this again soon. It's simply beta omega square, not squared minus omega square, plus 4 beta squared omega squared. So here you will see that the real part is actually the usual conventional evolution of uh, the interplay between space and time. Uh, C by n behaves like the, uh, the velocity uh, with which the, the wave is propagating, the phase velocity and uh, the, the decay in the amplitude is governed by this uh, the imaginary part of the refractive index. So let's just keep that in mind. And uh, now let me get back to separating out carefully the real, real and imaginary parts of the refractive index. Uh, let me do that quickly. But before that, I want to make a, a, a small approximation. So uh, the approximation is the following. We are, we are going to look at the near resonant behavior of the system. That is, my claim is that, that my omega naught is quite close to omega. What this implies mathematically is that when I write down omega naught square minus omega square, 
which I can precisely write down as omega naught minus omega times omega naught plus omega. So the claim is that because these frequencies are quite close, then my difference term, that is my so let me finish this. So you see that this is almost equal to, so omega naught plus omega because they are close to each other, it is simply twice omega times omega naught minus omega. Right? So this is how I can replace my omega naught square minus omega square in the denominator. So you see my n square of omega, it's simply 1 plus n e square by epsilon naught m times twice omega omega naught minus omega so this is what gives me my the new form for the refractive index and uh, now what I can do is I can clearly see that my n of omega is simply the square root of this quantity. Now if you have densities of the active medium pretty small, uh, that is for example you are looking at a gas or for that matter you are looking at a crystal which is doped with active medium. So even though the crystal has a background refractive index, the resonant part of it that is close to resonance, it's only the resonant species within the crystal that that is of interest to us, the active medium, and that density might still be very small. Uh, so you see in variety of cases one can actually consider the second term here to be small. That would mean I can uh, approximate this as simply 1 plus n e square by 4 omega epsilon naught m divided by omega naught minus omega i beta. And now what I do is I undertake the separation of the real and imaginary parts to identify uh, individual terms. So my n real comes out to be the following and the imaginary part simply is so you can clearly see that the imaginary part is largely governed by the decay in our Lorentz model and the, the real part has this interesting omega frequency dependence uh, important to note that the uh, the notion of a uh, resonance is still captured in this. So uh, whenever we talk about uh, a media which has got a background refractive index and we are interested only the the species that is resonant, then one can write down uh, this the the real part of the refractive index in the following form, and you can very easily derive this where uh, n um, real is simply n background. Uh, the real part of it plus you know any e square for n background real part m omega times omega naught minus omega and the same near resonant approximation that you have done And the n imaginary part in presence of a background medium is simply n background imaginary if there is any plus n e square for n background real epsilon naught m omega times beta by plus beta square. Uh, important points to note, the way I have arrived at this is simply you know, taking a few steps. Let me quickly indicate, I am saying that my polarizability has got to do with polarizability that belongs to the background set of atoms plus a polarizability which is for the resonant part. 
right and once you do this then you see i can write down my n square of omega the total as arising out of 1 plus n background set of atoms and i could sum over all the background species right uh, because they might be different types and alpha background set of atoms polarizability epsilon naught plus the resonant set of atoms right n r alpha r omega by epsilon naught right so this is the part which i recognize as n background square this is the resonant part which i am retaining as it is in my above formalism so you use these uh, these two and you will be able to quickly uh, derive this generalized uh, form which i have indicated here which is basically you know these two equations in presence of a background medium all right so after this we are going to look at the the frequency dependence of the real and imaginary parts because that gives us insight into the kind of behavior of what happens to the fields as they propagate inside uh, such a, a medium.